Good day to you all. Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Tech, where I, your host, Vic Miles, sit down with thought leaders in our industry to have a conversation about how they see themselves at the inter intersection of technology and innovation and business excellence. Uh, today, I'm excited to welcome to the show uh, Daniel Flores. He goes by Dan. Uh, he's the president and CEO of Fastenal uh, since 2016. And Fastenal has been a company since 1967. So if you haven't been properly introduced to Fastenal, today's your day. I hope that you are uh, equally as enthralled with uh, their business model and how they sort of uh, go at um, in improving the uh, industry that we work in every day. Uh, with over 1 million unique SKUs, Fastenal also provides a variety of services, including inventory management, vending, and industrial machining. Most importantly, they lead innovation in supply chain technology with a focus on efficiency, visibility, and control. And they have a high touch, high tech approach to encapsulating, you know, which is encapsulated by their tagline where industry meets innovation. Um, they're an industrial distributor and a supply chain solutions company, you know, and, and, and hopefully that will uh, be begin to make sense as we sort of unpack this conversation, Dan and I. Um, and Dan has had a central role in setting and executing the company strategy. Um, he started as their uh, CFO and in 2019 uh, was named uh, in the Forbes list of America's most innovative leaders. Um, I think you were number 76, Dan, so it's quite the accomplishment. Congratulations. Uh, prior to that, as I mentioned, he was CFO where he honed a deep understanding of the company's culture and strategy. Um, and was acknowledged by the Wall Street Journal for his financial leadership. So high accolades indeed for a thought leader in this space. Uh, Dan has four children, loves the outdoors, grew up as a farm kid in Wisconsin. And so we may unpack a little bit of that as well, Dan. And when asked about a personal accomplishment uh, outside of work, he counts climbing Mount Rainier among, among his many accomplishments. And uh, we, we've spoken uh, at length, Dan and I, over... Uh, the past couple of weeks talking about how we might sort of bring this conversation to the community. Uh, but Dan, uh, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you. When I first think about uh, Fastenal and how we might have this conversation, I, I thought about, you know, I did a plant tour with you, with your team. And I think about a bill of material for many of our consumer goods uh, products companies. So if you're a CPG in the audience today and you're on any part of that value chain, uh, this might be of interest to you as we sort of unpack how Fastenal thinks about improving uh, discrete manufacturing, uh, I I again, in the market. Uh, and, and you provide things that go into making the things that many of us use every day. Uh, I, I believe the name Fastenal comes from your early years of providing fasteners. I see your uh, a picture on the wall there with with nuts and bolts and screws. You can you can. Uh, it's amazing you can build a complete business off of that. But providing those things, uh, screws, couplers that that hold together and bind um, a lot of the the consumer products that we use today. Uh, today your catalog is vast. Um, it includes uh, personal prote protection equipment or PPE for production workers. It includes things like sensors used in the manufacturing process to ensure that that we get that perfect hue uh, on our consumer baked goods. Um, and the supply chain piece comes in because these parts are often on the critical path for getting products out the door of a manufacturing plant. And one of the most impressive things I think about Fastenal is how deeply you're connected uh, into your customer's business and how you take on the same goals uh, of manufacturing production, both safety, uptime and efficiency, you take those goals on as your own. You could just be a vendor and sell parts, but you're actually in there and, and you care deeply about uh, how your customers are able to sort of move their process uh, and, and, and get to finished materials. Um, you, again, don't just sell commodity parts. And so again, Dan, again, welcome to Beyond the Tech. Thanks, Vic. It's good to be here. Yes. I, uh, you know, Dan, you and I spoke several times um, and uh, I'm interested in understanding how you got to this this B2B space. You know, what inspired you to be 
uh, uh, Dan Flornis, you know, head of, of Fastenal, a global company that provides, you know, services, uh, distribution and, and, and wholesale supply chain services to, to manufacturers. Maybe you can sort of talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah. Truth be told, if, uh, if I went back in a time machine to a younger Dan and, and looked at where I thought the future, my future would be, I wouldn't have thought it was being spending most of my adult life in a community of 25,000 people in southeastern Minnesota. Uh, I, as, as you mentioned earlier, I grew up on a farm. So being in a rural setting wasn't um, foreign to me. But uh, uh, when I went to college, I, uh, I went for agricultural business as a major. And it was, uh, I, was I was blessed to have a couple internships during college. One exposed me to an agricultural distribution business. And I found I liked the business side of it maybe more than the pure agricultural side or equal to. So I expanded my background um, in, in school to include a lot more business and accounting courses because I wanted to have a solid foundation for business. And my second internship ended up being with a, a CPA firm. And, and I, and I kind of stumbled upon it. And it, the firm is KPMG. Many of you have probably heard of it. I ended up spending a, a, about a decade with KPMG, primarily serving manufacturing uh, clients, uh, construction, distribution. And, and I spent two years of that decade teaching, where I'd travel around the United States teaching folks early in their career about things to look for in business from an accounting perspective. And when I returned to Minneapolis in the, in the early 1990s, uh, Fasto became one of my clients. And that was, and, uh, and I, so I got to know Fasto, and, and I got to know the culture of Fasto. And what attracted me to Fastenal was, here's this company in southeastern Minnesota. Um, when I was first exposed to the company, we were probably $150 million in revenue, annual revenue. The, uh, you know, a little over 1,000 employees. Uh, when I joined the organization in 1996, we were about a $250 million organization, about 2,000 employees. We had opened a couple locations in Canada. So I guess technically we were international, but it was a little tongue in cheek. But it was a case of uh, what I found intriguing about the organization was the culture of the organization, how they, how they, how we treated each other, how we challenged each other to, to, to move maybe beyond what we thought was possible of our own ability set. And, and I really, I, at the time I said to my wife, you know, this is kind of an organization that I want to be part of because it's great people um, with an opportunity to do great things with their skill set. And they're not painted into a box based on their background or their education. It's what you can do, what you can accomplish, what you're willing to change and, and go after. And so I joined uh, 28 years ago. Wow. And, and, and you've been, uh, moving along ever since you mentioned teaching and hopefully we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. The, the fascinating culture of we're all in this together. As I mentioned, um, I've had a chance to, to be sort of in market with your team and understand how the various uh, locations sort of uh, interconnect. There's, you know, there's not a lot of competition. I think there's a bit of healthy competition in terms of, you know, who has the best numbers and that sort of thing. But maybe you could talk to us a bit about that. How is that kept alive and what role do you play as leader, as, as you know, the, the head leader today? You know, the, the, uh, there is friendly competition in that we're very transparent with our information. We're transparent with, with the, the numbers of my peer of, of where, where we're discovering success. One of the things nice about grow, uh, starting organically, we operate on one platform across the organization. So it's, it's easy to, to get perspective what other people are doing. And it isn't a case of it's competition in that you want to you, you, you beat somebody else. It's, common to, it's competition to elevate others. Because what usually happens when we find somebody achieving success, their peers will reach out to them, say, how are you doing this? Or I always see my role, both as CFO and now as CEO, as one of, almost at times, almost a cheerleader mm -hmm. in that you're, you're out and you're, you're sharing where we're discovering success and, and you're pointing things out to people and challenging them of how, how can this serve your market, serve your customer and serve your team? Cause 
uh, you know, one of the, we always talk about the obligation of a leader and one of the obligations of a leader is how you find success for your, the members of your team, because you want your folks to find success because it makes it easier to recruit. It all, it's, it's also much more enjoyable an organization to be part of. To just come to work every day. Yeah. Yes. I, I appreciate that. And, and for our audience, Dan, hopefully they're starting to see the uh, the magic that is fascinating, and perhaps it's 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 you, Dan, and and others. But as you talk through that story, I'm reminded of, frankly, Sam Walton. I, I, I you know, with my Walmart background, I put a lot of uh, things through the lens of of Walmart, and so this open sharing, this one platform, we're all going to move forward together. We're one of the hallmarks, and uh, it's. Uh, I know your founder has has written a book. And hopefully someday we'll see you in print. But this is uh, it's it's a fascinating story. Um, and and as I we you and I talked, um, I talked about retail, right? I'm I'm usually I've always say in retail, and you reminded me a few times, Vic. We're not exactly a retailer. We've got a bit of a different uh, business model. Um, you know, we're a wholesaler. But can you elaborate on that distinction? And you know, I'll point out that one of the big distinctions that I saw is 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 your is your is your margin you know not from a financial standpoint but your the ability for you to be creative with how you serve right it's not you know i've got you know 13 weeks to get this off my books kind of thing and, and i'm sure you have some of that but can you unpack the difference that you see between this b2b wholesale distribution and what i generally refer to as retail yeah so first off uh i think as time has progressed and, and more people are are comfortable today versus five, 10, 15 years ago with with a with a wider range of ways they source things. Um, one thing that I, I suspect everybody watching this video, you source things online. And, and and you do it for a number of reasons. If you live in a, a community of 25,000 people in southeastern Minnesota, you might source things online because they're not available in your community. You might source things online because you're you you want to learn about the product. You want to learn about the item because you're doing it isn't just a buying exercise, it's a research exercise. But once you decide what you need, or if it's something that you buy on a repetitive basis, you want it to be really easy. And so what we find is a lot of our customers today are so familiar with ordering online and they like the simplicity of it. And so the B2B experience and the B2C experience um, have, have moved, I think, together. And so sometimes it, it's, it's a little bit of a blur. And usually the difference might be in discrete specifications you need for a product. It might be, uh, it might be in the volume you're purchasing. You know, you're not buying ones and tens, you're buying hundreds and thousands. Sure. But, but conceptually, you want it to be really simple. And, my, my wife had an expression that she said, and this was 25 years ago, and she was working in technology. And, and the comment she made was, uh, she was talking uh, about a piece of technology and, and she was frustrated by it because she said, you know, it should be like a toaster. And people just know how to use it. And it's intuitive. Nobody has to give you an instruction manual of how to use a toaster. And so one thing that we try to do is, is our technology should function that way like a toaster, it's reliable, it's simple, and the beauty of it is the simplicity of use. Again, it's not complicated, but it might be doing, it might be complicated things that are supporting it, but the serve to the customers made simple. Wow, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an excellent analogy, thank you. Um, when Maybe now's a good time to sort of, for the audience, sort of draw the picture of what is Fastenal? Where, where do, our companies experience fastenal um and and i've driven by one there's there's a, you've got a little office a little regional office i think on uh, highway 102 here in the bentonville rogers area and there's a corridor that goes between i must have driven by it thousands of times literally thousands of times and and never noticed the building and now i can't unsee it you know after visiting um, but but where would we see Fastenal? What are, how how do you manifest? Is it are you on the plant floor? Are you retail locations? And talk to us about that. Yeah, so we have uh, we we have uh, 
roughly 1500 locations and, and i'll talk about north america we're in we're in 26 27 countries but the bulk of our business is in north america so let's say 15 1600 locations that are branch locations and and that's that can be a retail location you could go in at many of our locations not all depends on the depends on the market but you could go into most of our locations and buy from us like an industrial hardware store but that would be that's actually an incredibly small piece of our business what we, the way I think of our business is we have these 15, 1600 branch locations. We have 1800, what we call onsite locations. Now that onsite location is a dedicated customer, one customer business. So let's say you were a customer of a branch and we were doing 30,000, 20,000 a month with you supplying a, a wide range of things. But as we've, as we've grown to know each other better, you would like us to be involved with more parts of your business, and we'd like to be involved with more parts of your business. Oftentimes, we'll create what we call an on-site. And that on-site today re um, represents about 40% of our revenue. When I stepped into the role, it was about 10% of our revenue. And, and that's where we're, we're many times, not all times, it might be a discrete business that runs out of the back of a branch, but it's dedicated with a team to one customer. It might be the customer doesn't have room for us, and we're in a building next door to them, but we're serving one customer. Or it might be we're physically in their plant. And that, and the way that mass manifests itself is we might be supplying production parts right to your production floor through a, a Kanban system with embedded technology. We might be uh, deploying bending devices across your facility and dispensing products that way. And we probably have an area in the facility where it is a fastenal, almost like a mini branch in the facility and, and employees in that facility can come up and source things directly from us from a window, for example, of getting product. But, but we try to be as close to the customer's point of use as we can economically make work for them and us. And so if there's enough volume, if there's 100,000, 150,000, sorry about that, my phone rang there. Um, there is a... Uh, um, if there's enough volume, we'll set up shop internally. But if there's not enough volume, say you're doing 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 a month, we'll operate out of our traditional branch, al although we're delivering products typically to your facility, probably to the to the production floor or the plant floor. And uh, and uh, But you might come in periodically to our branch for products, but again, 90% of what we do goes out the back door of our branch to a customer, less than 10% goes out the front door. Got it. And and these are products like degreasers and 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 comfort mats and PPE and screws and drill bits and just it's, anything that's consumable. It's anything that you could use in a facility. So about 25 to 30 percent of our business, I would think I, I think of as more production centered parts. So it, it um a, the majority of that so 20 out of that 25 to 30 would be, we're selling you a fastener that's part of the widget you're manufacturing. So it's holding it together. It's a refrigerator and the screws and bolts that are holding it together, we supply. It might be hydraulic fittings. It, it might be uh, metalworking for machining parts in your production facility, but it's, it's, it's related to your manufacturing activities, your discrete activities. The, the, Another chunk, probably 40% of our business, is still going into that industrial or um, co uh, consumer products company. And it's being used to, to assist the employees in that facility. It might be the PPE that they wear when they work. It might be the safety glasses. It might be the gloves. It might be uh, apparel they wear. It, it, it might be things used in the maintenance of the facility or the production line. So it's stuff that's consumed in that building. If you move outside the, the manufacturing setting, we might be at a, at a college or university supplying products and set up. We have on-sites that are at universities. We have a big presence in the Big Ten. And so you might be, uh, uh, we might be supplying products that are maintaining that college or university, or it might be a K-12 school district. It might be a hospital. It might be a warehouse that's supporting uh, uh, a, a distribution activity, or it could be an e-commerce activity. I would suspect 
if I if I if I could see the entire audience listening to yeah. this video, everybody listening to this video has purchased something in the twelve in the last twelve months where we have vending deployed in the facility where they source their item. Because we we are we we are partnered with all the major e-commerce organizations on supporting their distribution operations for their employees' safety in that facility. Yeah. That's uh, it's amazing. And I, I, I think that I wanted the audience to just get a sense for uh, where you sit in the value chain that we generally uh, talk about. And so thank you for that uh, if, picture. If, if I may, uh, one um, when I think of our relationship with our customer, uh, people use the term partnership in many different ways. Uh, when I think of a partnership we have with our customer, our covenant with our customer, is we'll help them find a better supply chain for their business. And in doing that, um, we discover together things in their facility we can help them with that they're struggling with, or they or they want to make easier, or they want to move it closer to the point of use for their employee. Because one of the values, one of the reasons we've been so successful with the vending platform, we have a 110, 120,000 vending devices deployed in 26 countries today. One of the reasons we've been so successful is a lot of the things that we vend are individually inexpensive. So if you think of that item that's being vended, let's say it's let's say it's eight dollars, and you have an employee in your facility that the cost of that employee fully loaded might be fifty dollars, seventy dollars, eighty dollars an hour. And if you think of that employee spending fifteen minutes to walk across the plant floor to go find something they need versus two minutes to go to a vending machine and push a button, that eight dollar item, if I if if an eighty dollar employee is spending fifteen minutes to go get, that eight dollar item becomes a twenty eight dollar item. Yeah. Or it stays an eight dollar item. Well, and I I think it's also uh, super important to think about your the transparency that you spoke about in that even the individual understands this is an eight dollar item, right? And so I you know in, in some cases they have to scan their badge for costing and that sort of thing that says it's me getting you know a new set of gloves. You know, I reached into the engine and it punctured. And now I need a new set of gloves. And and you've got all sorts of controls that you sort of manage along you know, for the customer. But it just that transparency up and down the value chain that says we're doing it this way so that we can keep costs down, right? Yep. Keep benefits for the employee up, keep jobs going, that sort of thing. And and, and keep people safe. Yes. Safety is number one. Yep. Anything else you would add, Dan? No, I think that, that, you know, I think that covers it pretty well. Okay. I have, uh, I have a question for you. Oh, sure, sure. Um, what do you see, and I'm going, I'm going off on a tangent with this one, but sure. what, do you, what do you see as the evolution of, you know, we sell into North America and we're, we're, we're global, but we started in the United States, we expanded into Canada and Mexico, so we, we do a lot here. What do you see as the evolution of the current offshore approach to manufacturing and making it easier for manufacturers to compete? You know, and, and uh, thank you for that, Dan. This one is is close to my heart, right? We uh, live in the U.S. We've raised families in the U.S. We want to see um, our jobs, you know, see the country prosper, that sort of thing. And so, um, and yet we are a global economy. We like cheap goods, you know, that sort of thing. And And I think there's a mix there. Right is in, in this evolution. When I think about um, offshore manufacturing, it's largely a, an approach to commoditizing labor, right, and then co-locating that labor with raw materials, right. And uh, in in other countries, they, they found it easier to do that, right, with fewer regulations and just just cost of labor. Um, and when I think about the three levers, if you will, labor, materials, and then what I like to call as the intersection there, cost of handling whether it's warehousing, uh, trucking, that sort of thing, all of the PPE, the, the, just the cost of doing business. You know, it would seem that labor, that large line item is is the place to go. And many companies have sort of uh, done that by going offshore. But I think the big unlock is, you know, streamlining the global supply chain, right? It's why I wanted to talk to you and have you speak to the audience here is, is you know, we're, we're sourcing 
is location dependent based on a total cost of ownership efficiency. Right. So, so when you deal with procurement people a lot, right, that's your business or the, the purchasers, right? And so when you think about just the cost of an item and not the cost that getting a truckload comes with, right? So getting a truckload comes with, I have to unload it, I have to warehouse it, I have to then, you know, do my inventory management to it, where really I might just need 45 pieces a week, every week. You know, for the foreseeable future, do I need to buy truckload in order to get that piece count down and then add all of the cost? I think our uh, sort of North American manufacturers would benefit from using and, you know, my favorite sort of Six Sigma approaches, the Japanese Kaizen, right? And asking the, the five whys up and down the value chain. Why are we doing this? Because just because the final land will, the understood landed cost is lower, but Upstream, we've got higher uh, storage costs, higher transportation costs, higher whatever handling costs. And I think that that sort of mix, right? Instead of just doing one knob that is labor, right? Mix the supply chain piece in there. And, and supply chain has been hot, right? It's since uh, even before the pandemic and then during the pandemic, it, it was everything, right? I have to streamline my supply chain. And so I think that, uh, frankly, I look to facet all what you do. Or manufacturers that help keep costs down to be part of that unlock that I see um, as the as the change in in evolution. Um, automation is the last one. I, you went on a tangent, so I'll, I'll go. I'll follow you here. Automation's a big one, right? That says maybe we, if you don't have people in the facility, the machines are happy to operate at forty two degrees Fahrenheit, right? People not so much. Right. And and so, but you might need it for your manufacturing. The HVAC and safety costs go way down. So I think automation on the face of it might seem like, hey, you're taking jobs away. Well, no, I'm I'm leaving those jobs. We still have to maintain the automation. Uh, we found that in tech with data centers. All the big cloud providers have figured out, you know, many years ago that you don't actually need people in the facility. We used to run these giant data centers and have 45, 50 people, you know, always on the floor. And, and you had all these safety briefings about if you hear this alarm, you've got to leave because the Halon system is going to suck all the oxygen out of the room. Yep. And, and then, you know, we started to say, well, do we really need people? We could rack mount these things and just plug and play. If one goes bad, it's like a tractor trailer going down the highway and one of those tires flips off. They just, you know, it's probably not the best practice, but they, they just, they can keep moving kind of thing. So I think sort of looking at the whole supply chain holistically is, is probably the unlock for getting manufacturing to, to remain and increase here in, in North America. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, during our conversation, Dan, you touched on the importance of innovation, right? And you talked about vending. I'd sort of like to, to unpack that a bit. Um, and especially in response to COVID-19, where which was for many of our businesses a disruptor. And those of us, you know, also referred to as the chief innovation officer, COVID was, right? And, and for those of us who, who um, sort of came through it and thrived, it was about taking the work that we had done and saying, let me apply it to this new disruptive need in the business. And it it feels like Fastenal did that as well. I don't see the big shift. If I look at your sort of, if I talk to your folks and I look at your business model, when do you think the shift occurred that allowed you to say, let's bring together RFID technology for, for, for pieces and part count, uh, vending for fast delivery and no touch uh, uh, delivery experience and other things. When How did you make that shift? And as a leader, right, there's a lot of folks that sit on the fence with technology and say it costs too much, but you seem to have, you've made it look easy. What, what do you think? Well, there's a, there's a little bit to unpack there and I'll try not to please go too far no, as on unpacking it. But the origin of Fastenal back in 1967, our founder envisioned a vending company selling nuts and bolts Almost like, and you're you're too young to appreciate this. Uh, but when I was a kid, you could you could go into a you go into a laundromat, and you'd put in you know a few quarters, and you could wash clothes. And uh, and what he envisioned was, and it, maybe it's six, seven, eight hundred square feet, a, a relatively small storefront. And 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 our founder envisioned you'd go in, but instead of washing clothes, you could go in twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, 
put in a few quarters to a, a vending machine and pull out a box of fasteners. And he figured he could have 500 locations across North America. That was his market research. So he convinced four friends to invest in this company. And uh, about six months, 12 months into it, they had the machine. It was all designed. They, they were getting estimates on, on, uh, on building a machine, but they wanted some revenue. So they just started calling on businesses. What they discovered is the technology of the 1960s couldn't do a few things they wanted to do. And a lot of stuff customers were buying didn't fit in this little vending machine. And mm -hmm. so Fastenal was actually plan B. We, 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 we scrapped the vending idea in 1967 and just became, we, we would call on businesses and be their supply chain partner, primarily fasteners for 30 years. And, uh, and as we moved into the 1990s, we expanded beyond fasteners, but we were still using the same model to go to market. Around, around 10 years later, in around 2007, we had a customer, and there was, people were using industrial vending, but it was niche. And the expensive, the, the, the technology was really expensive, and it was, it was frankly over-engineered, which made it, again, expensive, but not incredibly reliable. Mm, it, brutal. Because there was just too much going on in that little box. And uh, we had a customer that really wanted vending. And, and we will react to a customer's need. And we deployed a couple hundred vending machines to, with one customer out west. And, and we really started to study vending. We still felt that the machines were not reliable. We still thought, thought they were too expensive, which meant that the addressable market was really too small to get excited about. But we also started to learn how it could bring a value to supply chain because you're pulling stuff through rather than pushing stuff through mm -hmm. to a customer. You're pulling it to a customer and that's inherently more efficient. So we started doing research on vending companies and we discovered a vending company located in Des Moines, Iowa that had built a platform that we thought this might work. So we we started working with them and, and and they were happy to do business with us, but they really weren't, I don't think, overly excited about it because they didn't, they saw their future going vending in a different direction, but they had developed a vending platform that was essentially an internet appliance. So there wasn't much stuff going on in the machine. It was talking to something in the cloud where all the work was being done. So it was a much simpler machine, much more reliable, much more cost effective. And we started deploying it. And a lot of our employees and a lot of our customers looked at it and because it was essentially our Fast 5000, which is our most prominent model, is essentially a snack machine that's that's intelligent. And, and, and most of our employees and customers were kind of like, you want to put industrial supplies in a snack machine? You know, kind of looking at it sideways. We said, yeah, we think it's more efficient. And it lowers, you can deploy product closer to the point of use because we're essentially taking a, a shelf out of our branch, wrapping it in a metal box and putting that shelf right in the customer's location. Yeah. But when you put product that close to the point of use, it's usually a, it's usually a free for all and you can't keep track of what's there. And there's a lot of waste by putting it in this box, you eliminated those issues. So the product's always available. And what happened, what we discovered is most of our customers saw their consumption in products going through vending drop. 20, 30, yeah. 40% because the hoarding factor went away. Because if it's always available, everybody doesn't need to have a stash of gloves that they forget they have or a stash of safety glasses or whatever the item might be. And it becomes just readily available. So there's no, again, it's kind of like during COVID, most people were out, out buying three, four, five months worth of toilet paper because they weren't sure if they were, were, were toothpaste because they weren't sure if they were going to get it. And because everybody did that, there was no toothpaste or toilet paper to get. And so it actually lowers consumption and it's more efficient. Now you might say, well, if it lowers consumption, isn't that bad for Fastenal? No, it's it's actually good for Fastenal because it's good for our customer. And we only have this much market share in those products. So we love growing into it, bringing savings to our customer, but it spawned other ideas. So when I stepped into the into the role this role at Fastenal, about fifteen percent of our revenue was was at that point in the in the two thousand fifteen timeframe. So from two thousand seven to two thousand fifteen, 
we went from 0% to about 15% of our business going through vending. And we had a, probably another 4 or 5% where the customer was ordering online. And typically for us, that's not somebody going to our website. That's somebody where we have a punch-out catalog embedded in their intranet, and they're ordering from that punch-out catalog, stuff they've identified they want to source from Fastenal. So those two pieces combined were about 20% of our business. Today, if I look at those two pieces, it's about 60% of our business. Okay. And what really took off is as we stepped into COVID in the, in the early parts of 2020, we, uh, we, we, had, we had developed our own mobility platform to bring, to bring a type of automation to a lot of our more manual bin stocks. And we had planned to deploy that over a, a several year period we weren't sure how the adoption would work, but during COVID, everything changed. I remember being out in Seattle. This was February of 2020. I was out visiting branches. And at the time, there was a, I, on the national news, there was a rest home that had been hit by COVID. It, you know, people, people died. And everybody was on edge. And I remember visiting some branches in the Seattle area. And I said to them, why don't you close your front door? And they said, well, we can't do that because what if a customer needs to come in? I said, I said, do you have a, do you have a piece of paper? And we put a sign on the door. We are open for your safety and ours. And it was handwritten for your safety and ours. We will bring the product to the door. Call this number. Because I, I said to our employee, I guarantee you every person coming to that front door probably has a cell phone in their pocket. And everybody is anxious about what is this new thing called COVID? And I'm, and I, and I'm a little scared. And, and, and we have to adapt and we'll adapt today and we'll change this. It was about a month later that we did that across the entire company where COVID kept getting progressively worse. And I remember sending out a message. I believe we sent out a message over the weekend in mid-March to about 400,000 customers that said on Monday, we are open for business, ready to serve you. Our front door is closed to protect you and us. And part of the logic for closing the front door was 90% of our product goes out the back door and we're delivering it to a customer's facility and we're going right to their plant floor. And, and we were seeing a lot of our customers closing down their facilities to keep it safe for their own employees and limiting access. Well, if they're gonna let us into their facility and we don't do the same thing with ours, we're their weak link. Yeah. And we didn't want to be that. And um, one thing, I, I typically end the day by reading through web feedback that comes in from customers. And, and I'll, I'll spend you know, 30, 40, 30 minutes uh, to an hour just reading through comments. Um, sometimes I'll call customers when I read their comments. And uh, I remember really reading, I was probably spending two hours a day during during the first six months of COVID, reading it because it was a fascinating study in human nature because we had a, we, we had a pandemic going on and it became a political issue. And everybody had a different opinion on how we should approach it. And I was seeing that playing out in the web feedback. And about 52% of our revenue is in metropolitan areas with more than half a million people. 48% is in rural areas like Winona. That's, and that's just because that's where the manufacturing base is in, in North America. And it, it was interesting to see how people were expressing their anxiety. And I talked to a lot of customers. Some were frustrated we'd closed our front door. And I remember some customers that I talked to and I said, you know, here's why we closed it. I don't think there was a conversation at the end where two human beings could discuss something and we both understood each other's perspective. And typically that conversation ended with a customer saying, wow, I didn't appreciate that about your business. If I were in your shoes, I'd have done the same thing. Okay. And, but, but it also meant everybody was, when there's anxiety, sometimes you want to solve anxiety. And so our mobility platform that we plan to be a two month rollout occurred in, excuse me, a two year rollout occurred in about five months. And it, what it allowed our employees and our customers to do is we could fulfill their orders and we'd be in and out of their facility faster and we could do things from a distance, even though we're in their facility. Same thing with vending. 
if um, you could get product without being within close proximity to another human being, and for a period during COVID, that's really important. And, and our business expanded. And the reason our, our, our FMI and our digital footprint expanded so dramatically, I think, I think it would occur over time naturally. I don't think it would occur in two, three, four, five years. But people were willing to change because they wanted to figure out a way to, to operate, to operate safely, to keep their coworkers and their family safe. In, in our FMI platform, whether it be a Kanban system with an embedded RFID chip, because the only thing that changes is in a traditional Kanban, you go out, you grab empty bins and you're around everybody else. In an RFID embedded Kanban system, that empty, that empty bin is placed on the top shelf. There's an RFID reader that, that picks up the fact that it's there. It transmits a message to the branch or to our serving employee that says, there's a bin here that's hungry and needs to be fed. And, and the same thing, we, we use the infrared technology to create essentially a gas gauge on bins. So if there's three lights going across, kind of like the bottom of a garage door when it closes to, to warn you there's something there and it stops the door. Okay. If these three lights are going across, if they're all blocked, I know the bin is full. If the top light shoots across, I know it's a third empty. If the two lights, I know it's two thirds empty. So you essentially, you have a gas gauge. So you can plan your day differently. You're actually more efficient. You can, you can serve your customer in a different way. And if your customer really desires social distance, you can do it in a way that you couldn't have with the, with the traditional you know, technology or lack thereof. And so that completely changed the landscape. And what we've seen, especially, I see this a lot when I'm talking to customers when we deploy the RFID onto a production line. A lot of customers really like it because if I'm the plant manager or if I'm the production manager, it's a sign of efficiency. So you see this area that maybe is, can be chaotic at times. All of a sudden, it's, it's, it's clean, it's organized, it's efficient. And you, you use that as, as planting, planting a seed that maybe impacts other areas of the production line. And the production line becomes safer, more efficient. And when it's safer and more efficient, our manufacturing customers or any of our customers become more competitive in the marketplace because yeah. they're more efficient. And competitive isn't always about cost. It might be, it's, I can be more competitive with my time. I can pay my employee more. I can be more competitive with my production. I can offer a better price to the, the marketplace. Maybe what on my source of supply, things that are important change because reliability is a, is a factor. How they produce the part is a factor. And, and it completely allows you to rethink what you're doing. And we like being part of, being partnered with that, with our customer of bringing innovation and ideas to their, their production, whatever that production is. Yeah. I think then what you've just done is is encapsulated the my thought about this podcast. We, we we call it beyond the tech, right? Because if 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 you're and I I met you through your uh, CIO, your Chief Information Officer John Soderberg, um, and if he and I were having the conversation, he would have probably talked to me about those three lights and how tough in an industrial environment it is to to keep them aligned and what sort of materials and, and titanium clean. And, and clean. clean. Right, they actually have to shoot through, and you got grease and smoke and and things in, in places. And so, for the tech folks in the audience, um, that description was a business description of a of a business imperative that has a technology solution. Right, you you're banging around those those bins. Right, a, a bin full of bolts. Right, a um, uh, half inch bolts is it's not a it's not a delicate environment. People are reaching in, grabbing bolts. You know, I, I saw one of your customers putting together electric engines that that fed uh, some sort of fan or something. Um, and you just reach in and you grab, you're on a production line and you're not thinking about the three lights, right? Or the RFID sensor and, and, and that sort of thing. And so at the same time as the, you were in Seattle, your tech team, was on the back end saying, how are we going to productionize this? How are we going to get this ready for prime time? Where will we test it? 
um, how many customers will you know receive it? You've got your own supply chain in the back end, right? How many of these can you make and that sort of thing? But thank you for that description. I was you know again fascinated by that because I think that's the first time I've heard you describe it like that. So thank you for for unpacking that. I would like to go a bit into uh, tech. When I uh, shared the stage with John, we talked about artificial intelligence. You know the the topic of uh, you know, topic du jour, if you will, and uh, there's a lot of experimentation uh, in AI, right? And some of that is three guys, one of one who has a PhD in your business that you put on a plan to go figure something out, right? Not necessarily connected to your business process. Some of that is I have this need, can an AI solve it? And that's a real tangible need. Um, but I also see a lot of people who, companies who will not get past the experimentation stage. So I'll ask you to think about what as a leader, right? And and being a CFO previously, understanding the cost of these things, what caused you to have the, the confidence to go forward, right? Because I, I use Facetall as my current example to say, if it can work here, AI that is, it can work anywhere. Um, right. And you've got a very unique business. Um, and yet there are aspects of, of AI that will be game changing, right? That you, as you look to expand your business, you, the way you expand your business is by, by sourcing more products, right? Going deeper into the catalog that, the, that your customer needs, right? Whether that be that, you know, $6,000 CNC machine bit, Right or or other things, right? Maybe it's the rubber mounts that go under the machine, and you've got to be there on a weekend, and they lift it up and put it down to keep vibrations. And um, and I know you employ industrial engineers who will think about uh, tensile strength and and angles and and all of the different materials, temperatures. Um, that's a lot to think about, Dan. And so, how did you get comfortable with with AI? And then we'll talk about how you guys are are employing AI in your business. You know, I think it was back in 2019. Um, I remember reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, and it was it, it it touched on how to think about technology, but it also touched on how do you make that more usable to people. And at the time, I, I challenged our board and our leadership team. I shared the article with them and I said, give me some of your ideas. And and one of the things that came out of that was, so we've had a corporate university at Fastall since 1999. And because our workforce, our employee base is very distributed like our business. So you go into most of the markets where we have a branch, you know, branch might have five to 10 employees and you're going to have a range of experience in that group. And in our business really isn't a seven and a half billion dollar monolith of a company. We have two, roughly 240 district business units scattered around the planet. The average district does around $30 million a year in business. And if you do the math, 30 million a month, 200, 250-ish district managers, that's a seven and a half billion dollar business but it's really this district by district and a typical district probably has 80 to a, you know 70 to 100 employees again scattered across branches and on sites so one of the things that we've always spent a fair amount of resources on is when we bring people in how do you bring them up to speed about our products to be useful to our customer to each other and then as they're in their career how do, you do, how do you continue to develop their product knowledge, their leadership skills, maybe their technical skills to applications engineers, things like that. But you start thinking about those pieces. And the idea that came out of this discussion was creating a chat bot where all these experts within Fastall could, could share their knowledge into that chat bot. And we created a chat bot that had, I don't know, between 100 and 200,000 question and answer pairs. And it was a tool that was used uh, for the technology at the time. I think we did a nice job with it, but it was used when people kind of got in a jam and there was no other route, you know, because my guess is every district 
they have a few people that are the go-to people you call when you have a product question or, 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 or some type of issue. And you just have a network of people. And that's, that's, that's powerful. And human beings do that naturally. But w- what if it's, I'm talking to a customer and I'm talking to my, my usual go-to people and nobody has an answer to it. Or it's 10 o'clock at night and I need an answer for a customer. And I can't get a hold of somebody. That's what this chatbot was about. And so when we started looking at applications for AI, we said, can we bring AI to the chatbot and make it work better and be a more useful tool? So that was our first project we worked on. I, I'm pleased to say that we had a, a working um, piece that they, they felt good enough to let me play with it in early June, because we started it back in December. And in, by early June, we had a working model that they, they said, hey, Dan, give this a try. And I started asking it questions. I was stunned at how well it worked. Because the old one with the, you know, getting a some kind of a match on a question and answer pair was okay at best, in all honesty. And so we deployed it throughout the organization um, into June and, and essentially said to our employees, here's, here's what we built here. It is another resource. It's part of your network. When you have a question, give it a try. And the way we set it up, we have work and web. And the work is all this vetted industrial product or leadership knowledge you mentioned earlier that our founder, Bob Curlin, wrote a book. It's called The Power of Fast on People. It's a leadership book. We've embedded that entire book in the in, in our AI chatbot. And, and uh, we call it Blue. So it's AI Blue. And, uh, and so people can ask Bob Curlin a question about leadership. And, it, and it, it draws it from that book. Or they can ask about product something with a faster, something with some other type of product. They can ask about our, our vending technology, a question, and all the material that's in there, they know it's quality material. Because sometimes when you do a search on the web, you get back some good stuff, but you also can get back some garbage. So on that work piece, know that this is vetted source of information that's being surfaced for you that's available 24 by 7. But maybe you don't find the answer, or maybe you want to deep, dig a little deeper. You can toggle over to web, and it will go out into the web, and it will do the same kind of search. And when it brings back the information, whether it's an internal work or external web, it also lists the citations of where the answer came from. So if it's a if it's an internal search on AI, it will show the employee, oh, here's 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 what we think is the answer to your question. And if you want to go to the re- the reference, it's from the faster guide, page eighty two. Yeah. So you can go and you can read that maybe that section, and but it it it, it gives the employee time, but it also gives them the ability, and the confidence to learn on their own, but to answer the customer's question or to answer their question, and and we're slowly taking that AI now that we've learned how to do step one. Let's let's use it for in, possibly improving our search internally. Maybe our search that our customers see. Maybe we can use it so so that that sixty percent of our business that's going through our digital footprint, about forty two of that sixty is actually going through some type of device. Maybe we can we can put AI to study that just like a human being would, and we can surface ideas for our customers of here are some things to consider about our stocking level. Here are some things to consider about product substitutions that may, it might be something that's lower cost, same functionality. It might be something that's higher cost, that's better functionality, and you'll get a better value because it'll last longer. But it's it's bringing that AI to those kinds of things that a human being can do, but sometimes there's not enough hours in the day to do it. Right. And, and that's where AI, we believe, can be an incredible tool and what's unique about us and all these things I talked about, we have these, you know, 3,000 plus, close to 4,000 locations scattered around the planet where we can we can disseminate that knowledge and put it at their fingertips. And the reason um, our technology works so well is we have people local to go into a customer's facility. Those local people are interacting with customers every day with questions, something they can't find on the web or something they can't find for another supplier or something they have a question about. And we can bring them answers. 
we believe that having those types of capabilities at our fingertips close to the customer makes us a compelling value to their supply chain and their business. And they will share more of their spend with us. It will grow. But it, that's but, the but, name but of the game. Yeah. And, but, but the, the, the AI technology allows us to take it just to a level that five years ago just wasn't even conceivable. You Heck, know, um, Heck, a year ago was inconceivable. A, a year ago. It, you, it, you know, fr from the standpoint, not that it didn't exist, but to actually bring it to the market in a thoughtful way that can, that, that serves this business model and our customer supply chain. Yeah. I, I, I remember uh, talking with your CIO, John, and, and he relayed a story to me um, and talking to one of your uh, employees in, in market. And he was talking to them about, you know, Blue, the, the AI uh, assistant or, or co-pilot, as we like to call it at, at Microsoft. But um, and he said, you know, what if we could then embed imaging, right? So that when the customer said, I want one of these. Right? Can, no. can you source me one of these? The answer is always yes. Right? If you work professional, but but what is it? Where do I get it from? What are its dimensions and your its specifications? And being able to have AI look at a picture and say, here are the four possible alternatives. Right? And as opposed to going to your eighteen year employee who knows that that is a uh, a Duncan coupler that is used in high you know um, pressured steam uh, equipment. Bringing that expertise to folks who are new to your business or who just don't have the, you know, haven't spent their 10,000 hours in the business, um, I think will will change. And and John relayed to me that, that when he shared that with the employee, they, they had like an emotional response. Yes. Do you know what that could do to sort of, and they didn't talk about self-esteem, my ability to sort of feel part of the team or anything, but that's really what it was is, wow, you're making me one of the smart people. Right. Without having to go ask the question. Right. This is the sec 17th question I've asked you today. And your folks, you know, you don't mind because in two years you'll be getting the questions. Right. That kind we, of thing. We've all been the person that asks the questions. Exactly. And at, some, at some place, our obligation to others is to be the person that helps answer some of the questions. I agree. And but to make us more competitive. Right. Us being the manufacturer, your business, my business. Um, bringing that to bear doesn't have to sort of displace roles, but it can just really enable us to be uh, better of who we are. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm conscious of your time, Dan. Thank you for spending your, your so much time with us today. Um, any closing thoughts around the culture? You talked about how you got here, um, uh, you know, the differences between retail and wholesale distribution, uh, you know, it, it, that, that fascinating story about you know, you started as a vending company, right? Thinking that we could just let people self-serve in 1967. What, you know, what a visionary. Um, how do you keep it going in your in your culture? Uh, maybe if you could give the audience a bit of, of wisdom around uh, fastenal success with, with maintaining your culture. You know, it was a number of years ago, at, we had an employee uh, event and, and, I, and I was speaking to the group of employees and I and I said to the group, I said, you know, I, I, I talk to students a lot. I talk to them. I travel. I talk to employees. Most classes that come in for training at, at our Winona campus, and we have campuses scattered throughout the world, but at our Winona campus, a lot of people come in for leadership training. And, and I'll go in and talk to them. And at some stage in your in your life, you know, and I'm, I'm, I, I turned 60 last fall, but at, at this time I was in my early 50s. And I shared with the group, I said, you know, here are 10 things I've learned about life. Some of it comes from where I grew up. Some of it comes from where, I, you know, educators I had. Some from people I've been blessed to work with in my career. But there's 10 things that I said, I'm going to share with you. And, and these, in my mind, are the some of the best traits I see in Fastenal. And make sure we're instilling those and challenging our team with those as we move forward. And, and I'm, I'm going to just read them off if you Please don't mind. Do. Uh, the first one was listen well. Listen to your customer. Listen to each other. But listen well every day. The second one is communicate well. You know, sometimes it's not just tell them what to do, but maybe why. Uh, learn. Uh, number three, learn every day. Figure out what it is that you read. What's your source of improving your skill set every day 
Learn from others and teach others. Number four, be willing to change. Number five, make great decisions. Make it today. Share with the team why. Number six, develop leaders. The ability can exist in everyone. So challenge everybody to be a leader in their, in their way. Seven, surround yourself with people that are better than you. Better can be they're different than you. They, they have a skill set you don't know. They have an experience you don't know. Be comfortable that the person that works for you can know more than you about a topic. You're stronger as a team. Trust people. Incubate the ideas that emerge. Uh, cherish, this is from my grandmother, cherish and embrace the special words and show respect for all. Special words are, you know, the please, the thank you, you know, maybe a smile. And then finally, and this is coming from a kid that grew up in a, a, a part of the country that gets nasty winters. Enjoy an outdoor activity in all four seasons, wherever you live. And, uh, and, and I think that that's part of the culture that I found when I joined Fastenal and that I share with others. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's powerful. I took notes while you were talking. Thank you, Dan. And uh, if, if we, we may get a request for those. Um, and, I, and I suspect you can walk into any Fastenal or contact your Fastenal employee in the plant and get those 10 recited back to, uh, to you. So thank you again for, for being, a, being with us today on uh, Beyond the Tech and having a conversation. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been great. Thank you again for the time. Thanks, Vic. Have a great day. Cheers. I know.